one. Hey guys, I want to start off with an apology. This episode, I decided to make some changes to the settings on my camera, and that caused some pretty significant issues for me on the editing side of things. You'll definitely see some issues with the lighting, focus, stuff like that. So try not to look too closely. Today we got the honor of being joined by firefighter paramedic Russ Brown, who is actually the host of his own podcast, the Med Inspired Podcast. I'll put a link in the video description. Um, he actually has had quite a few really good guests on his podcast, the most recent of which was actually Dr. Jim Ducanto, and they went over a whole bunch of airway topics. I really enjoyed the podcast, so definitely go check his podcast out, of course, after listening to ours. Anyway, thanks again for your patience, and enjoy the podcast. The views, opinions, and advice in this podcast are not necessarily those of our employers. Medical topics are discussed largely using best EMS protocols. Discussions here should not replace your own services, policies, and procedures. Hey guys, welcome back to the PCHD EMS podcast. I'm Jeff, this is Dr. Northheim, and today with us we have Russ Brown from Southlake, a uh, firefighter paramedic with Southlake uh, Fire. And we're going to be talking about uh, all things syncope. So, Dr. Northam, if you want to kind of give us a little rundown of what we're going to be going over. Sure. I just think it's um, good to understand, um, you know, when medics arrive, what, what information to gather, especially for us in the emergency department, and what are the important things, and, and to try to really do a, a, a good thorough workup in the field and to get a great history in the field, because many times we don't get that history. It's really important uh, to know, has a patient had syncope in the past? What happened? Do they have any trauma during the syncope? Um, any chance of pregnancy? Any cardiac history? And so getting as much information as you can on scene really helps us in kind of piecing everything together. Um, I also think it's important not to just kind of blow off the 18-year-old syncope and, and to really still do a 12 lead and make sure it's not a brigada or, you know, suspicion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and get a blood sugar and, and really get a good set of vitals. Um, I think I think those are all important pieces, and so I think we'll probably do a couple study, uh, a couple case scenarios here, and kind of talk through it. And Russell kind of talk about what he looks at when he gets to a call, and then kind of when he brings the patient to me or Jeff brings the patient to me, what, what I'm looking at, and and right away is the patient sick or non sick? Do I think the patient's getting admitted? And what are the factors that that I kind of think about and piece together to decide whether or not the patient needs to stay? And, and ultimately, the patient can decide on their own if if they want to stay or not. But you know, as we get to the older population, abnormal EKGs, potentially abnormal labs, um, you know, story from, from Russ or Jeff when they bring me the patient, um, all kind of plays into the decision making that goes on in the emergency department. And I think that's uh, it's a good review for all of us. Russ, would you give us some background, kind of where you're from, what you do? Uh, yes, sir. So I'm at South Lake right now, South Lake Fire Department. I've been there almost 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I came from Denver, Colorado, where I worked uh, for Denver Paramedics. And then I was at AMR for a few years prior to that. All right. Cool. So. Well, um, like Dr. Northam said, um, I'm just going to kind of run you through a couple case scenarios, and then we'll kind of go with what Dr. Northam would be doing in the ER as well after that. Awesome. So, Let's do it. All right. So first one, you've got a 32-year-old female. Um, goes out as a party three. It's two in the morning. Um, so you and your partner... Uh, do you, do you respond on an engine or a squad? Or? So we, we have an engine and then a okay. medic that will respond. So okay. typically three fire paramedics on the engine and then two fire medics on the ambulance. Okay, so it's priority three, so I'm guessing you would just get the medic, right? Uh, we would get the engine and the medic. Okay, all right, good deal. Well, you guys roll out two in the morning, priority three, uh, notes say, feels like I'm going to pass out. And uh, yeah, you get out there, 32-year-old female, she just said, you know, not feeling super great. Um, that's about it. What, what okay. are you going to start with? Yeah. So for me, for me, the most important thing, um, obviously we're going to stabilize, you know, airway, breathing, circulation. Uh, we're assuming that's all good, uh, in the meantime. Oh yeah. She's sitting there talking to you. Right. Just, yeah. Um, so at that point for me, the most important thing is the history. Um, I, I always, I always say the history is like the king and then the queen is the 12 lead ECG. 
So we're going to get a good history and we're going to look for uh, what I like to call the red flags of syncope. And then obviously we're going to get a set of vitals and a 12 lead ECG uh, and a blood sugar as well. All right. So vitals all seem pretty <clears throat> unremarkable minus uh, her resting heart rate is 114. Okay. Um, other vital signs look pretty normal. Um, she just said she's every time she stands up, she gets gets really dizzy. Yeah. So so first off, um, did she actually uh, have a syncopal episode, or you said it was she, she so. felt like she was going to pass out? Okay. Um, so I do want to mention that I think we talked about that earlier. Is that um, they did a study a few years ago where they looked at near syncope versus an actual having a syncopal episode. And they looked at 30-day risk of, of adverse events, and they found that it was exactly the same for both near syncope and syncope. So we kind of work those up the same way in terms of um, whether or not you actually completed passing out or you just kind of had that sensation. Wow, okay. Um, it's also really important to differentiate between uh, dizziness and syncope because a lot of times people will use that interchangeably. You know, they will, they will say they felt dizzy when what they really mean was they, that sensation that they were gonna pass out. And then vice versa, sometimes people say, I felt like I was gonna pass out, but when you really, you know, uh, get a good history and kind of question them a little more, they actually mean they were, they were dizzy, right? So they, the room was spinning, they had vertigo. And when I hear dizzy, I think more neuro. Sure. Um, when I hear syncope, I'm thinking along the lines of cardiac. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to try to differentiate that um, and try to tease that out. Of Which can be difficult sometimes. People still keep saying dizzy. And so it is sometimes hard to parse out in our patient population, especially if they're nauseated or if they're vomiting, right? The dizzy ver vertiginous patient, whether it's peripheral or, or you know, we're thinking stroke, um, sometimes hard to parse that out. It is really hard, and I know they did a study years ago. Newman Toker did a study where he actually went in. Uh, this was in the emergency department. He went in, he asked patients uh, to describe, you know, what symptoms they were feeling, and they would say either, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm going to pass out or feel like I'm, you know, the room's spinning. And then he went back in the room like five minutes later, and their story had changed. Right. Or so, the chest pain patient that says, it's not really pain, it's more like right. an elephant on my chest, right? So it, it's that's sometimes difficult. But I guess, you know, in this situation of syncope versus near syncope, the workup is the same. It is the um, same. I would say getting getting a good history, like Russ said, from people around. Um, because I had a, I just had a lady yesterday in the emergency department where she said, oh, no, I didn't go out. Well, she didn't remember going out because she was passed out, you know. And the bystander said, she was out for five minutes, right? So that really changes it. So... I'm not going to get that history unless the family shows up. And the earlier I can get that history from EMS, the, the better it is. So really trying to drill down on this information in the field is really important to me in the, in the emergency department. Yeah, and I want to circle back to, and I know you mentioned this patient didn't actually have a syncopal episode. She just kind of felt like it. Um, for people who actually have a syncopal episode, sometimes that gets mistaken, and I'm sure you see this as well, as uh, a seizure because people will actually have these myoclonal jerks and, you know, bystanders will tell you, oh, they had a seizure, and it can kind of lead you to go down the wrong pathway. So it's kind of important to try to figure out whether it was a seizure or syncope. Uh, and there's some clues. Uh, I know that, like, um, lateral uh, tongue lax is really specific for seizure. It has about a 98% uh, specificity. Um, Urinary incontinence is actually, I think a lot of people hang their hat on that, but it's, you can get urinary incontinence with syncope as well. I would say postictal state as well. I mean, typically syncope doesn't have a long postictal state, so if they're kind of having that, you know, postictal state where they're taking a while to come around, I mean, that's usually a pretty good hint as well um, that, you know, maybe down the seizure route. Yeah, I think postictal is important because syncope is what? It's a transient loss of consciousness, and you have a rapid return to baseline. Right. So most of those seizure patients, they're still going to be confused and they'll have confusion for a while. One thing that I, I think you just said uh, that I thought was kind of interesting is, and it's true, syncopal patients are really not good historians because half the time it seems like they don't even know it happened. Right. So I mean, I've seen, I've seen it happen in the past where we get called out and, you know, we're talking to the patient and no, nothing happened. I'm fine. And, you know, if you're not 
if you're not on your game, he'd be like, okay, well, cool. Like we just like, you know, clear, no, no patient, you know, false call, whatever. It's like, no, the, this was witnessed or like they actually passed out. They just have no idea it happened. Yeah. Um, so that is definitely a, a good piece of the puzzle. They're not. Another, they're not another thing you can look for too, uh, Salim Rose, uh, he's a ER doc down in San Antonio. He has a thing he calls the 10, 20 rule. Have you heard of this? So the 10, 20 rule is if you have less than 10, myoclonic jerks, it's typically syncope. Greater than 20 jerks would be uh, more lean towards seizures. Yeah. Now, obviously, we're not like, you know, asking bystanders, you know, how many uh, jerks do they have? Well, they had approximately 14. But, you know, typically people will, will say, well, they jerked a couple of times, and then that was it. That kind of leans more towards syncope, whereas if they were like, man, they were, you know, on the ground for like a minute, two minutes just jerking yeah. now we're kind of thinking possibly seizure, seizure. so we're not going to hang our hat on just one thing we're going to take that whole you know all these different signs and symptoms and kind of so with the in regards to the history in the field i'm looking for the what i i think i mentioned before the red flags okay. so i'm looking for the one of the biggest ones is lack of a prodrome so what do I mean by lack of a prodrome? So people who um, typically have a vasovagal syncope, they'll get that kind of prodrome, they'll get that narrowing of vision, Feel they'll warm. get hot, flushed, a little nauseous, and then they go to, you know, next thing they know, they wake up on the floor. Versus the person who just says, I, I was walking along, bam, I went down. That makes me more think of a cardiac cause of syncope because with syncope we're trying that's what we're trying to do ultimately is determine is it a cardiac or non-cardiac cause now there's other causes of of syncope too you can uh, pe subarachnoid hemorrhage ectopic pregnancy but um, i think the biggest thing for us is is it cardiac or non-cardiac so lack of a prodrome is a big one right um, exertional syncope, so any syncope uh, with exertion is cause for concern. And I think that value comes in with a younger patient, right? Okay. So that 16-year-old uh, playing football or, you know, working out on the Peloton or running on the treadmill and they go down, that we need to start thinking about some sort of congenital heart abnormality. And we can get into that in a minute, like hokum, things of that nature. So you, you mentioned um, you want to get a 12 lead, you know, fairly quickly. And just d playing devil's advocate here, uh, in this scenario, let's say you've got a 32-year-old female. She's not having a heart attack, man. Like, what are you looking for? Like, well, why, do, why do you need to get a 12 lead so fast? Like, she's young, healthy. Like, what you, what's going on? Right, right. Um, yeah, so with syncope, we're not necessarily looking for ACS, right? We're looking for uh, the killers of syncope. Um, what I like to call the big bad uglies, right? So the things like, and we can go through each one of these, but I'm usually looking in the syncope patient at, at five major things. So we're looking for AV blocks. We're looking for what's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, that's actually the number one killer in young people. It's the number one cause of sudden cardiac arrest. Especially in the exertional population. So just want to make sure those patients, that those are the ones that kind of scare you with, you know, we minimalize the young person. Maybe we don't do a 12 lead on and they say they're fine and then we end up no riding them, right? Yeah. So those are the ones that, you know, at least go through the process of getting the 12 lead to make sure that looks okay. Um, ultimately, the echocardiogram is going to be the, the where we make the diagnosis, right? But yeah. Um, I'll let you. I'm glad you mentioned that, Doc, because um, those patients typically, uh, they're walking around and a lot of them don't even know that they have this congenital heart abnormality. And they're real prone to going into polymorphic VTAC. And we see this, we see this in the news sometimes, right? We see the uh, football players uh, that go down. Um, Hank Gathers was uh, one of the more well-known ones. I think uh, Reggie, Reggie Lewis. Yeah, there's some ba down, basketball think, folks as yeah. well, but those are the those are the young in shape athletes that it's it's uh, that it happens to. Yeah. So and no one's no one or I should say no one typically is going to know ride the 85 year old from the nursing home that has a laundry list of medical conditions, mm -hmm. uh, but you can certainly know ride the 16 year old that's healthy, no medical history, and you just kind of blow them off. Nah, you know. Uh, so that's why it is super important to get the 12 lead.
But but Hokum is one I mentioned. Um, I mentioned uh, what did I mention before? AV nodal. AV so AV blocks, AV blocks. right? Hokum. Uh, WPW is another one. So Wolf Parkinson's White uh, syndrome. Looking for your delta waves. We're looking for delta waves. We're looking for that short PR interval and that wide QRS. Um, then I'm looking for Brigada. Brigada is a big one, and we can throw that up here in a little bit. Yep. And there's a couple of different types of Brigada, but it's basically a um, sodium channelopathy uh, abnormality. Um, the Brigada brothers actually discovered it. It's a okay. group of doctors back in, I believe it was the 90s. Yeah, that's, and they that's discovered an important it. one. That's an important one that if we can find that on a 12 lead and transport the patient, I mean, they, they the cure for that is defibrillator placement. So. You can potentially save that person's life down the road, uh, which can be huge. Believe it or not, I saw one Brigada at South Lake yeah. a few years ago. So, yeah. but the patient actually knew they had it though. Yeah. So, but I mean, you just never know, right? Mm -hmm. um, another rhythm is a rhythm called ARVC, so arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. I know that's a uh, yeah. mouthful to yeah. say. <laughs> so, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's actually along the lines of hokum. It's the second leading cause of sudden cardiac death in young people. Um, and you'll get this characteristic um, T wave inversion. It's typically T wave inversion in V1, 2, and 3. And then you'll get, um, you'll get what I, I call it a blip. It's like this little kind of notching, and maybe you can expand on this, Doc, but it's like a notching after the QRS. Yeah, I, I think we'll put some pictures up of it yeah. so we can really get the visual. Probably some other items, uh, making sure they're not in a block, making sure there's a P before every QRS, that stuff's important. Um, you know, making sure you're seeing P waves, you're not seeing, uh, you know, um, peak T waves, wide QRS, mm -hmm. all that stuff that would go along with potentially some hyper K, right? Right. Um, I think all that stuff's important. And, and was the patient just getting up off the toilet? Was the patient just having a bowel movement? Was the person standing for a long period of time? Was the patient getting a lab draw? All of that information is important. That can lead you down this kind of, you know, vasal vagal type route or orthostatic type route. And um, we'll go into orthostatic vitals, but I would not hang your hat on orthostatic vitals. I, I really tell our crews, don't even worry about doing them. I don't think we take long enough to do them. And, and it, it really doesn't, it, it sometimes can lead us down this rabbit hole of, well, they're orthostatic, then let's we'll give them some fluids and no rod. And when, you know, a lot of these cardiac patients also have abnormal orthostatics. And so hanging your hat on that, just like we used to hang our hat on, um, you know, whether or not nitro made the chest pain better or worse, right? Or whether or not you gave a GI cocktail and they got better. Um, it, 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 it's all important to take within this, this big puzzle that we're putting together, but I wouldn't hang your hat on. Yeah. I want to circle back to what you mentioned about the QT. So looking at your QT interval, uh, you want to be looking at the corrected QT. If you look at the top of your ECG, there's like a QT and then there, there's a QTC. So the QTC corrects the QT interval based off of the heart rate. And that's the one you want to be looking at. And I, there, there's different um, intervals depending on if you're a man or a woman, but I usually go off of just 500. It's, it's a nice, easy number to remember. So if it's greater than 500, that kind of makes me kind of take pause and, and be a little more concerned. So any QTC greater than 500 could be a long QT syndrome. And like you mentioned, Doc, you have, you have congenital QT syndrome, and then you can get a long QT from, from a whole laundry list of meds. I call them all the antis. So the antiemetics, the antibiotics, the antidepressants. Um, all of those things can cause a prolonged QT. Especially Zofran. We give a lot of Zofran. Yes. Right? So that can prolong it. So it's just one of those things to kind of use caution with. And, um, you know, absolutely. And I think a lot of medics don't necessarily start with the Q and go to the end of the T, right, which is important. I see a lot of medics kind of looking at the end of the QRS to the beginning of the T. So it is from the Q wave till the end of the T, right? And so 500 is kind of one that I use. I think some literature shows 480, 490, but I don't typically get too worried till it's above 500. Either. Right. And another uh, kind of hard and fast rule you can use is actually if you take two uh, QRS intervals and you take the T wave, and like you mentioned, Doc, uh, the end of the T wave, if that is greater than half the distance between two QRSs, that's considered prolonged as well. Well, um, let's assume on this, on this case study that you do all your 
EKG workups and everything like that, and you don't see any of those, you know, uh, killers, what would you do next? What's your next line of questioning? Assuming you've ruled out, not ruled out, but you know, you're, you're moving on. So the ECG is normal. Yes, sir. We don't yeah, see just, any. Just a little bit fast. Okay. Um, and vitals are good. Uh, other than other than the heart rate being 114, vitals are uh, okay. And there's no concerning things in the history. Um, like there's uh, no lack of prodrome, no syncope with exertion. Nah, she does say she feels like she's dizzy when she's walking around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess the thing for me too is to say you know has there been any volume loss right. So a lot of times people won't tell you, but, oh, yeah, I've had three days of diarrhea. Well, that could cause volume loss, right? Make these people feel lightheaded, make them tachycardic, potentially lead to some level of hypotension. We have to remember that not necessarily in the younger person, but some of our older patients, they're, they're maybe used to sitting at 150. So when they get down to 110, 120, which could be normal when we're looking at it, they could start to feel kind of hypovolemic, right? And you're syncopal and lightheaded. And so I think that's important. All Fever can dehydrate you, mm-hmm. right? Um, just being ill and not eating or drinking. So have they had some sort of volume loss, I think would be another good you know, history part to for kind of sure. help us put this puzzle together. I think for me, what's concerning for me in this case is the elevated heart rate, right? She's just kind of sitting there and she's tachycardic. Right. And I think to myself, anytime someone's tachycardic, I have to ask myself, why are they tachycardic, right? Is it, is it a volume loss? Are they dehydrated? Are they in some sort of shock? Is this an infection? And I'm looking for that cause. So um, in, in this situation, you know, you, you're looking for the cause of, of uh, volume loss. And she mentions that, well, hey, you know, I, I was late on my, uh, on my menstrual cycle. Um, but, you know, it came, it came three weeks late and it's just been kind of heavy. So... Um, what what would that kind of send you down if menstrual cycle yeah, probably anemia so, anemia so route so. obviously uh pregnancy right a topic i mean all that sort of stuff kind of come into picture um heart rate is she in any distress if she's not um i'm also thinking you know potentially if there is pregnancy could she be pe so maybe get a little more history on that or you know birth control if you had recent travel or you short of breath kind of hitting those things really looking on the 12 to see if there's anything that points me in the direction of pe but I think the first thing that uh, you know to do is to try fluids, try some fluids, mm-hmm. see how she does, right? See how she reacts. And so she doesn't. She needs to actually go to the hospital. She doesn't need to AMA. Yeah, I would say she needs to go. I, I would say a really good, you know, really good place to look on these patients too, especially your weak patients, your tachycardic patients, uh, potentially your blood loss patients. Just pull down their conjunctiva and look inside their inner lids. I mean, you can get a really good idea pretty quickly. You pull down their lower lids and they look pale that you know, they're probably gonna be fairly anemic. If you pull them down and they're nice and red, you haven't ruled it out necessarily. Obviously, some of us are getting chemates and doing stuff like that in the field where we get a hematocrit, and some of the rules that we have for discharging patients are based on what their hematocrit is, but um, I think that's a quick and dirty way to kind of just see real quick, hey, do you look like you know you could be anemic, right? Definitely not a no ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely not sure. a no ride. And this patient I, needs to go. I say that because I think in a lot of situations we see this patient and they say, "Well, I don't know. Do I need to go to the hospital?" And you know, if you if you just did a you know quick assessment, you're like, "Well, your blood pressure is fine. Your heart rate's a little bit up." But sometimes that happens. You're probably call, just anxious. Yeah, you're probably just anxious. You right. know, like in this situation, you know, um, in this situation it was an ectopic pregnancy. You know, right. um, yeah. like that's you're you're a few weeks late on a on a period. That's that's when they rupture, you know. Like right. six six to seven weeks, I think, is what I was what I was reading. Six to seven weeks is when they can start rupturing, and then moving on to like up to sixteen weeks, I think. Yeah, right. But you know, somebody might just think, oh, it was just a couple weeks late on a on a menstrual cycle. Well, no, that's this is this is something much worse than that. Right. So. And I want to mention a couple of things, a couple of points that you point out is we we tend to get fixated when the the patient will lead us, right? So oftentimes what I see is the patient will say, well, I haven't had a lot to drink today. I think I'm just dehydrated. And then what happens, that medic kind of latches on to that diagnosis and then searches for clues to support that. Without, without Without looking at the big picture and saying, what else could it be? And yeah. And I will tell you that, you know, just getting labs in the ER, majority of the patients that tell you, I just can't hold anything down. I've been vomiting for a week. 
I will tell you about 90% of those patients have completely normal electrolytes and a completely normal B and creatinine ratio. And according to the labs, I mean, they may be a little bit dry clinically with maybe a little tachycardic, but typically they're not hypotensive and typically they are not lab wise dehydrated. Their sodiums are okay. They don't have elevated, you know, hypernatremia, the B and creatinine ratio is normal. And so even despite those patients, right? So somebody just not drinking a lot one day, eh, I mean, unless they have a lot of volume loss with heat or working outside, right? But absolutely right. I mean, you can't let people lead us. We have to make sure that we've kind of checked our boxes. Do our due diligence, you know, and you mentioned like they, oh, you're just anxious. You're tachycardic because you're anxious. Well, anxiety, you know, that's like down here, right? I always tell people we're, this is emergency medicine. We start with worst case killers and then we work down. And I would argue that most of our patients are anxious. So, <laughs> right, right. We can't we can't hang our hat on that. Yeah. So, um, okay, let's do a, let's do one more uh, quick case study that we can talk about some more um, electrolyte imbalances or EKG uh, abnormalities. Um, you've got a you get called out uh, middle of the afternoon, fifty five year old male for a fall. Um, it's a lift assist, and he just says, "I just need help up off the ground." So. Um, yeah, go for it, man. Okay. So, uh, once again, uh, airway brain circulation, right? Vital it's, signs. It's a, it's a lift assist. Uh, general, just, um, general. Just, imp- okay. So it comes in ground, as a lift assist. He's just laying on the ground says, I, I can't get up off the ground. I just, yeah. I just had a little stumble and, and I'm done. So, so we could have an entire podcast on, <laughs> uh, lift assist. Very scary topic. <laughs> yeah. And it is fraught with, uh, with danger, right? Um, so I think we have to do our due diligence here and kind of really ask ourselves, you know, why, why can they not get up? Mm-hmm. You know, why, uh, what's the issue here? Um, did they fall? Did they injure themselves and have a very high index of suspicion for um, any life-threatening causes? Yeah. No, this guy so just I says... would probably get a set of vitals. And, okay. um, Even though it's just a lift assist? It depends. It okay. depends. But okay. there's, there's, you know, it depends on how the patient's presenting. And once again, uh, all joking aside, once again, it's back to the history, right? Mm-hmm. What, what is? Let's take the history in conjunction with how the patient looks. He's got a history of diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. And you said this patient is how old? Uh, Fifty-five years old. Fifty-five. Yeah. yeah, I'm probably getting a set of vitals. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, <laughs> blood pressure looks fine. It's uh, 120 over 80. Uh, his heart rate's a little slow. Of it's course, fit, yeah. It's 50 beats a minute. Um, he's breathing 20 times a minute, and uh, SpO2 is 98%. Okay. So his respiratory rate's not 16? It's not it's 16. A, yeah. No. <laughs> this one, they actually checked. Yeah. yeah, they actually checked it. Yeah. They put him on in title. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, 20 is a little, 20 is a little high, okay. you know, um, so I would kind of investigate a little more. Yeah. I'd probably, I'd probably uh, talk to him and encourage him. Hey, can we check you out? Can I at least put you on the monitor? Kind of see what's going on. Okay. Uh, um, the more you talk to this guy, um, you begin to question whether or not he really knows why he's on the ground. So you actually took the time to have a conversation with him, and the yeah. more you talk to him, you're like, do you, you know, do you actually understand why you're on the ground? Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen this before, but you know, oh, yeah. people assume that they know why they're there. They assume like, hey. I stumbled, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a threshold right there. I must have tripped right. on that. They justify it in their minds, kind of like we were talking about the mm-hmm. dehydration thing. Right. Um, oh, I probably just tripped, but he doesn't really seem to remember actually why he's there. Okay. So that's very concerning, right? So now I'm going to really uh, encourage that he needs to go to the hospital. Okay. Um, just based off of, of risk factors and age. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to get a 12 lead ECG. Uh, look for all those abnormalities that we talked about earlier, looking for uh, blocks, bradycardia, tachycardias, um, and then all of the big bad killers I mentioned, right? The WBW, the Brigadas, the long QT. Um, and what do we see there? Yeah, so the EKG, uh, you look. it looks like maybe just a borderline first degree block. The PR interval is a little bit elongated. Other than that, you don't really see anything too crazy. Um, and he's kind of like, man, do I really need to go to the hospital? I just, I just fell, you know, like, 
And I guess the question is, is he on beta blockers? Is he on custom channel blockers? Anything to kind of bring his rate down to 50 or not, right? If he wasn't on those, I'd be a little bit more worried about a, somebody in their 50s, you know, having a heart rate in the 50s. That's pretty um, abnormal. Somebody younger, obviously, it's not a big deal. But also, you know, if they had any injuries, are they on blood thinners? Did he hit his head when he fell? Is he completely back to normal? You know, A and four, GCS fifteen. Where we do we need to clear a C spine? Do we need to collar him? Like you know, all that sort of stuff. And then again, figuring out if anyone's around there that saw him. Did he have a seizure? Is he postictal, or is this just clearly you know he passed out quickly and came back around? So it's all important information. Yeah, with the altered mental status, that is uh, kind of moves away from just the uh, that he had just to run in the middle syncopal episode. Um, so we do, do we have any of those uh, physical so signs that we mentioned? He seems yeah. to be completely uh, oriented at this time. He doesn't, like I said, he doesn't really understand why he's on the floor. But yeah. ev everything else he seems to be aware of. He's GCS 15. Okay. Um, no obvious trauma. He does take uh, carvedilol, um, but other than that, he just takes a simvastatin as well and yeah. uh, glyparide. So. And you said his heart rate's 50. His heart rate is sustained at 50. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm with a doc. Like I'm, I'm a little more concerned with the heart rate as opposed to if it was a younger uh, patient. Um, a younger patient can, you know, we all know those people that walk around at like 40 and they're doing fine. Just the fact that he didn't really remember. Um, did he have any of those red flags that we mentioned in the history, like lack of a prodrome or anything like that? He has as you question him more uh complete amnesia around the actual yeah. event so he, so he to me not... that's that's concerning okay and obviously this is not going to be a run-of-the-mill lift assist yeah. or a no ride yeah and i mean that's that's <laughs> why these you know we have made it mandatory in our system for patients who end up on the ground i mean it's a little different if we you know, somebody needs help getting from their wheelchair to their bed. But if they've had an event, I can't tell you how many times. I mean, these, these people do not typically just end up on the ground for no reason. Exactly. Right? And I feel like across EMS, we minimize these patients. We don't want to do a report. I will tell you that a set of vitals alone will really change what you do for this patient. So, you know, we recently at one of our agencies had a lady that just felt this rush and she had felt it 10 or 15 times and she hadn't even fallen out of her bed. She was kind of holding on when our crew got there and they were diligent enough to get a set of vitals and her heart rate was 20. Oh my gosh. Are you going to treat that patient differently than someone who's Heart rate is 70, probably, right? What if they're hypertensive at 240? What if they're hypotensive at 70? What if their respiratory rate's 30? A set of vitals is going to help you. That's why they call them vitals. And so this person actually was having intermittent heart block and she ended up getting a pacemaker the next day. But if it wasn't for that crew's diligence, I'm not even, didn't even fall hanging on the side of the bed, right? Why was this happening? Especially an elderly person. A lot of these people have electrolyte abnormalities, dehydration, cardiac events, UTIs, right? Infection of some sort. So I will tell you a lot of these people, in the last patient you do not want to have a good report with a good set of vitals is the one that an hour later they call you back because that patient now is unresponsive with a subdural or an epidural, right? Uh, potentially broken hip we didn't pick pick up because we didn't do a good exam or a good chart, that would not be a great call to get retoned out, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so um, that's why we've made it mandatory. And, and I, I know people don't love it, but I'm telling you, we have found several cases, and it only helps the medic on their side with liability and documentation and just providing good quality patient care. I mean, for this lady, we potentially changed the rest of her life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if she wouldn't have been holding on the side of the bed falling and our medics hadn't done simple mm -hmm. set of vitals showing a heart rate of 20 um she she may have had that again or who knows what could have happened. yeah and i think we've all been there right we're we're uh we're all medics doc used to be a medic i think we've all been there right it's three o'clock in the morning you get toned out for the lift assist and and how do you react when you're going to the lift assist you're like you're like yes it's a lift assist like we're just gonna go there we're gonna put him back in bed i'm gonna be done no chart um but it's real fraught with danger. Yeah, you know. And and I, uh, you know, what you said just reminded me of a call I had not too long ago, where this lady was adamant she wasn't going to go to the hospital and she just fell and needed help back up. So I did a set of vital signs. Get, she seemed stable, but she had like, it was just kind of a, a sixth sense, like, hey, there's something going on with her hip. You know what I mean? Like she's just not quite putting. She's not wanting to sit up normally. She's not wanting to. She's guarding it. You know. And uh, so I sat her up and she's like, oh, I feel okay. I'm like, okay, cool. Why don't you take a couple steps with me? Like she stood up because we even stood her up and she's like, 
I'm okay, but I could tell it's like, are you sure? Like we've been trying to talk her to the, going to the hospital for 10, 15 minutes. She's like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I'm right. Just take a step. And as soon as she tried to move her leg, she's like, something's wrong. Wasn't able to move her leg. And I believe she had a hip fracture, mm. but had we not actually like tried to make sure she was back to her normal, you know, routine, yeah. like, Hey, take a couple steps with me, get back in this chair with me. Once she did that, then she realized, Oh, I need to go to the hospital. And tell that a lot of these people live by themselves. I mean, they don't have a way to, to call us back, right? right? So it's we had a guy the other day that was on the floor for four days. I mean, he couldn't get up, couldn't call. Um, oh, you know, man. he had to cubit his ulcers all over his body because he was laying on a, a tile floor for you know several days. And so I just think you know it takes us an extra few minutes, but that's really what we're there for, mm -hmm. right? So and I want to expand on what you mentioned about having the patient. You said you had your patient get up and walk. I think that's super important, right? If you can normally walk yeah. and now you can, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. Well, and I really need to be paying attention to that because I see all the time where, you know, the patient's sitting down or they're laying down and the provider doesn't take the time to make them get up and walk. Yeah. You know, if someone's going to refuse care, I want to see you walk yes. if you normally can walk. And if, they're, if they go to walk across the room and they've got ataxia or, you know, they, they can't do it, Hey man, you that go makes off. you more suspicious of the <laughs> neurologic side, right, right? The right. strokes, the bad stuff. So you need to go to the hospital. You go to the hospital for sure. What else do we need to talk about? Well, I was just going to kind of go over some of the things in the ER. So you know, yeah. once these patients arrive, obviously having you know Jeff or Russ or one of our other medics that have given us a great history, and that's why we try to get in the room when they come in to really get the story. Because uh, I think it's really important. I think it's really saved me multiple times getting the EMS story um, and, and really trying to understand what happened. Because the, the, they, they have spent 15, 20 minutes with this patient, sometimes longer. They've asked all the questions I need to know, hopefully. And so them just giving me a quick, you know, Cliff Notes version of it is, is really helpful. And what they've done, what they saw in their 12 lead, what their sugar looked like, um, what the family said is obviously huge. But when they get to me, obviously, I have the ability to do more laboratory studies. We used to do CT heads on all of these syncope patients, and there's really no literature on that anymore. So um, there's actually some decreased literature on actually even if they hit their head, the chances of them having actually something bad intracranial is pretty low. But if someone hits their head hard enough to have a hematoma, they're on thinners, so they're going to get a scan of their head, obviously look for injuries. But um, a majority of syncope patients are not neurologic and etiology, right? It's the basal artery, uh, you know, basal artery occlusion, which those patients are going to be sick, right? Those are the ones that typically syncopize. But your TIAs don't typically syncopize. Your strokes don't typically syncopize, right? I think it is part of a good physical exam to make sure they don't have drift, make sure their face looks okay as far as, you know, no facial droop, um, asking about their visual changes, stuff like that. But, you know, just getting probably another 12 lead, a good set of labs, make sure they're not anemic, dehydrated, um, thinking about PE in your mind, right, on the uh, uh, younger females, um, providing they haven't had a hysterectomy, making sure they're not pregnant, obviously a big piece. We're just trying to you know, ruling things out, but their past history is huge. You know, have you ever passed out before and you're 55 and haven't? That's a pretty good clue, right? They've gone through 55 years and never passed out. That's a big red flag for me, right? Yeah. If, if they're 32 and every time they get blood drawn, they pass out and they just had blood drawn, I mean, that's a little bit lower on my list, but I think it's important. I don't, I'm not sure a lot of medics do this, but you got to form, like you said, these are your five red flags. You have to have differentials, right? And we're really great. Uh, I think on the ER side and on, on the hospital side of getting, thinking of your differentials, right? Of your chest pain, of your dizziness, of your lightheadedness, of your abdominal pains, right? We're great at kind of looking at those and then checking them off. And you don't always have to get imaging or lab work to check these off, but at least checking them off in your mind. Okay. I don't think she's a PE. She's not hypoxic. She's not tachycardic. She doesn't have any risk factors. Her perk score is negative. We're good, right? Um, so in your mind, checking those off and document why you're doing that. But um, getting those labs, getting your troponin, getting the history, um, not doing orthostatics. If you feel like they're orthostatic, give them some fluids, right? Try to correct that. Um, seeing what medications they're on. Um, you know, particularly really taking a good look at the, the ECG. And for us in the ER, we have the ability to look back and see if there's been changes, right? right? And so has there been an axis change? Has there been some flip T wave changes? Have there been, you know, some changes that maybe look like, um, you know, HCM or Brigada or something like that? And so then we can kind of parse that into 
um, one of two really good accepted scales in San Francisco, and then you also have the Canadian, and and the Canadian has a few more pieces in that. But you know, obviously, those patients who have a, a cardiac history risk factors, you know, it's a good check mark. Abnormal ECG, good check mark. Um, you start thinking about those patients that are obviously anemic, low hematic crit, especially if it's new, probably going to be somebody that we keep. And so we kind of keep checking this off and then determine, you know, whether or not these patients are okay to go home. Um, if you're worried about the cardiac stuff, I mean, these patients need echocardiograms, they need cardiology consults. Certainly if we're going down the seizure route, you know, seizure precautions on these patients, scanning their head, um, you know, checking labs. I usually check a magnesium with all my syncope and, and seizure patients as well. I think that's an important piece. But, um, and then ultimately at the end of the day, you know, having a really good discussion with the patient. And mm -hmm. I'll still have people that are fairly high risk that say, I am not staying in the hospital and just making sure they understand the risks and benefits and really trying to talk them into staying if you think that, that they should. But really, you know, I do really all the same things that, that Jeff and, and Russ would do in the field as far as gathering that information. Hopefully if they come in by EMS, we've gathered that information already and then kind of piecing it together. Um, but you know, typically these patient, patients get placed on, you know, tele as an observation if we are going to admit them and right. get a little further work up uh, going on them. That's one thing that I'm, I'm gathering from, from this talk is just that, uh, I mean, from personal experience, I've seen us AMA a lot of syncopal episodes, and uh, I think that we need to be really careful doing that. And just because it's a, a young person, we don't need to be blowing off the, the cardiac side or the EKG side, I should right. say. Uh, which I know for a fact that we, you know, have a tendency to do. Yeah, and I think that's where the history really plays into it, right? Looking for those red flags. Was it syncope with exertion? And I wanted to touch on something you said, Doc. Uh, just looking for the, I call them the syncope plus calls. So the syncope plus another chief complaint. So it's syncope plus chest pain, mm -hmm. syncope plus shortness of breath, syncope plus, you know, um, headache or bleeding, back pain bleeding fever right yep. and that's going to guide your treatment as well right in terms of you mentioned pulmonary embolism so you know if they're having some pleuritic chest pain or they have a history that supports that right they just came from a flight from europe or you know they fractured their hip and Cancer they've been immobilized patient, all these patients high high on your differential um, list and then not not that EKG diagnoses PE, but but you mentioned the S1, Q3, T3, sure. which I think we all learn in paramedic school and everyone's like, you know, you learn it in paramedic school and you get out and you can't wait to see it and you never see it because yeah. it's like, it's, you, it's hardly ever it, there. If you do see it, you're bagging them because they were in cardiac yeah. arrest. Like, oh, and and it's, yeah. it's not that specific. Um, I mean, you certainly have no. patients that have that and don't have a PE, uh, patients with massive PEs that don't have that. So it's not, right. but it, it's all part of the puzzle. And, you know, I would say inverted T waves, anterior septally is kind of a mm -hmm. hint as well. I mean, you also can see some AVR elevation with lots of ST depression on those patients who are pretty massive PEs. Um, so it's one of those um, AVR differentials that we think about. Um, but yeah, that's that's all a really important piece of the puzzle. So I just hope that this podcast has, has helped you, um, everyone out there, kind of uh, form some differentials, make us uh, a little bit, um, uh, I guess, a little more fragile on, on making sure that we, we're doing the right thing on these patients, doing the right um, EMS workup, um, sure. you know, on all of them, do really good thorough assessments, good thorough histories, and, um, and we'll put up some of the EKGs that... Yeah. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially the Brigada, I think something that we, if we can recognize that and see that, um, you know, hopefully we can change that patient's, um, the patient's life down the road. Absolutely. Russ, thank you so much for joining us, man. I really appreciate yeah, it's it. it has been fun. Yeah, I hope Thanks, thanks for, for having us. me. Uh, absolutely, man. All right, well, uh, All right. thank you guys for joining us, and uh, we'll catch you next time. See you later. Thank you. This has been an episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. Thank you for joining us.